It is time for another episode of the Band Hive Podcast. My name is James Cross, and I help independent artists tour smart. This week, I am super stoked to have Kai from the band Late Nine here on the show. How's it going today, Kai? Going great, man. I'm happy to be here. Ah, oh, glad to hear that. I'm stoked to hear more about what you and the guys in Late Nine do. And I know you're also involved in other projects, which we don't have to get into, but before the call, you're mentioning you're about to head to the studio. So that's super sick. And mm-hmm. I know for Late Nine, you just dropped an EP a few months ago. You put out a song called Breathe For Me, and that had Tom from Patient 67 on it as well, which is a super cool Australian act. And we'll get into that a little bit later as we talk about the main focus of this episode, which is going to be about building community. But before we get to all Mm -hmm. of that, can you talk about what your musical background is, how you got to where you are now, and some of the highlights along the way? Yeah. um, So as a kid, since I can obviously remember, you know, my dad, my mom, I've always been musicians and they were in bands and stuff while I was growing up. And I hope so most people, your parents are your heroes, obviously. So you know, watching them like play shows and rock together and sell out bars and venues and the New England area as a kid, it was just really amazing to watch. And just, I always kind of wanted to mirror that after they stopped doing it, I was like, I'm still doing it. So I'm going to take this to the next level, you know, and make them proud and try to bring my band as far as possible to try to live the dream that, you know, I kind of watched them doing when I was younger and it was a beautiful experience to grow up in that and then have parents that are so musically inclined pass that gene on to you. And I had a lot of just creativity growing up and I had a lot of motivation to try to be the best musician I possibly could be. So that was the main thing. Yeah, that is a very good source of inspiration. A lot of people say this one album or that one band or something, which I mean, that's great. I love it when that happens, but it's cool to have such a personal connection to music to have that handed down generationally i think that's really amazing yeah and uh, the guys in late nine too like everyone's family is so like supportive and uh, all the parents are awesome mm-hmm. and they try to make it out to gigs and it's super cool we're all about family i love that and so as far as late nine is this the first band you were in or were you in other bands previously uh, i've been in plenty of bands you know so i actually just did a farewell show with my uh, deathcore project patient zero we just played our last show the other night it's nice to really have the main focus be late nine and be able to hone in on that and not neglect other projects you know like i felt like i was like kind of neglecting the other things i was in my other band that we're doing that stuff with today it's more of like a side project and that's how we treat it and people that are involved in it understand that and that's kind of just how that is but it's nice to just be focused on late nine it's the first band i've been in that has done very well as opposed to other ones you know what i mean so Say in a way, it's the first like real band that I felt like I've had. Yeah, that's fair. I feel like sometimes there's the bands that just hit it when everybody's a teenager. And sometimes there's the bands where it's like, hey, we've all been in four or five different bands previously, but this one just clicks. This is the one. And it sounds like that's what's going on here. So I'm really stoked for you on that. Having that outlet, especially with the family background and how much that means to you must be really come in full circle and feel conducive to what you want to do. Yeah, that's our slogan too. We we say it in a lot of posts, like at the bottom and fine print. It's one big family. That's what we kind of want to treat this whole thing as. Oh, that's so sick. And that ties right into building a community. So talking about Breathe For Me, the EP dropped in, I believe, May. That has Tom from Patient 67, like I said. And in my opinion, doing a feature like that is a great way to kind of combine two communities because yeah. they have their fan base, you have your fan base, and you put that on Spotify and both fan bases get that notification for a new song coming out. Yeah, so everyone gets kind of put onto both bands from different areas. It's sick. Yep, exactly. Both fan bases overlap and you have that kind of synergy from Patient 67 to Late 9 and vice versa. And especially since they're from Australia, if you look at a metalcore band in New England working with another metalcore band from New England, there's going to be a fair deal of overlap in their fan base in most cases. Whereas if you take a metalcore band from New England and a metalcore band from Australia, there's not going to be a lot of overlap because they are totally separate with the exception, of course, of online fan bases. But you're not going to have that same group of fans as you do when you're just grinding, playing shows all the time in their town. So when it comes to nurturing that community, that audience, what do you find is the most important thing you can do to actually build that up? Because it does take conscious effort. Building a fan base. So I do all like the social media stuff for us and the marketing. 
face behind the account type thing, because I feel like every band needs that. It doesn't matter who it is. It's whoever decides to just take the reign of doing that. I have been doing that for a long time. I go live on live streams. I answer people's questions. I make them feel seen. I give them my time of day. And I think what a lot of musicians lack at sometimes is that social interaction at a professional level, of course, keep it away from your DMS and all that stuff. Keep it in the public in your live streams and your comments, and you'll keep yourself safe, obviously. But it's definitely good to do to make them feel that genuine connection with you. Because when you're doing that, it gives them more of a reason to support you because they not only like your music, they respect and love you as a person. And that's like the best way that you can connect with your fans is giving them that extra bit of effort to, you know, make them feel seen, make them know that you care about them for what they care about in you. And so many bands, I should also preface this, say they complain about not having content. I'll see somebody tag them in a story and they don't repost it. Even something as small as that, repost a story and it's free content. You're complaining about not having content, you being the general band, not you specifically, Kai. People complain about that. And then it's like, you're not using the free content that people are giving you. So having that level of interaction, I think you're absolutely right. That's so important. Yeah. And like when it comes to the content thing, you know, then there's the other people that see what you're doing and then they don't respect it. They view your content as something else. You know what I mean? Like a reach for views or likes or this or that. It's like, if I want to run my shit on TikTok, I'm going to run my shit on TikTok. And you're going to keep your words to yourself because at the end of the day, it's like not everybody has a path paved for them a certain way where their band is being catered to by a massive agency or this or that or that. You know, a lot of the bigger artists, some of them might even look down on the whole TikTok thing or the Instagram thing. But at the end of the day, it's like, we're doing this pretty much independently and busting our asses to do it and be seen and create and have a table to eat at at the end of the day. So I just think respect should just go out to everybody that's just trying to succeed in this, but also doing it in a respectful and genuine manner. I just like doing what I do. And I've heard some hate, you know, after our song had trended and went viral and stuff, there was some hate from people in my scene and people that I know, like numerous people, actually, it sucked to see because it was like, wow, man, I thought I had your support and I was supporting your band too. But it wasn't a hundred percent like that. <laughs> At the end of the day, once one of them has a jump, you'll, I guess you'll see the true colors of how they really feel about what you're doing. But aside from that, I don't care. I like building the community and the fans are what matter to me. It's not this one, two, three people's opinions on what I'm doing as a person and a musician. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're just starting out, the other bands matter. But the further you get, the less other artists matter because you have that fan base who will support you. And something else that I want to touch on what you brought up there is a lot of times I'll see bands who it's not so much that they don't like what you're doing, but it's that your success makes them feel insecure. And so their just knee jerk reaction is to trash talk you, which is ridiculous. Yeah, I guess when it comes to like a local band feeling that way about you, that makes sense. A fellow person that you kind of came up in the scene with. And then there's also the ones that are steps ahead of you and don't understand the amount of stuff that you have had to endure to get to where you are by yourself. If you're busting ass, putting out content, I'm unhinged and just different. You know what I mean? Like that's the type of person I am. I don't want to be taken any way that I actually am not. So it's like, I'm going to display myself exactly who I am on the internet because that's who you're going to meet in person. Same with my guys. Everybody in the band is just a nut. We're not these typical serious people. We've gone through shit. We're all mentally not a hundred percent stable. Like, like we're writing music about <laughs> mental illness and substance abuse. Of course, we have that type of rough around the edges background and we're a hundred percent open with it because that's what our music's about. What's the point of not being open about the fact that we're kind of fucked up, but we're good people. And to highlight there too, that's why your fans connect with your music. This is like a specific audience you're going after, but that audience will connect on that facet of your music. They'll connect with you on social media because you're authentic, especially on TikTok. Gen Z is so quick to call people out for being inauthentic on social media. <laughs> they have that authenticity radar. They're just like, nope, you're a fake, not following. And then at the end of the day, it's like, bro, we're actually being authentic. Still, people will think that it's not authentic because they don't know you. If they know who you are, it's different. But when these people are just discovering you on like for you page, 
course, they're going to judge you right off the bat from whatever you're talking about, because they don't actually know what you've been through, who you are, who you came from. But we write these songs based around these specific things, but we write it in such this loose manner for people to take it in in any way that they want when they hear our songs or sing along to our songs. It's written in a way to cope with whatever we write about. But you can also listen to it and think it's about a breakup or think it's about a rough relationship with a family member. You can relate it to anything because that's how I loosely write the lyrics. So we can bring in everybody that's having problems. But also we have other songs that are not about problems and messages to the world too that we are working on as well that are going to be much different and we'll bring in another fan base of people who want that message. Yeah, I love that. And it's so important, like you're saying, if you were super specific with what you write, and sometimes that's necessary, but other times having a little bit of ambiguity there is what allows that connection, like you're saying. And this is one we actually, I did make an episode. I looked it up before I mentioned it. Number 192, Emotional Impact, How Sharing the Story Behind Your Songs Can Hook Your Fans. If anyone wants to listen to that, it's bandhive.rocks slash 192, the number 192. You can go to that website, that page to listen or find it in your favorite podcast app. And in that episode, I'm talking about like the pros and cons of telling people exactly what your song is about. Because sometimes you're going to tell people and it's going to give them the connection that they want. Other times you might tell somebody and they say, oh, I thought it was something totally different. I don't connect with it anymore now that I know that's not what it's about. So it can be a really tough line to tell. And I think probably erring on the side of being a little more vague, like you said, opens it up to that audience so more people can listen and relate to the music you're putting out, which is incredibly important. And that's probably a huge part of why you have 56,000 monthly listeners, which is incredible. And that's as of August 29th. So this episode drops October 10th. So by October 10th, it's hopefully going to be much higher than that. We'll see. Yeah, dude, we're just going to be sitting at 1,000 monthly. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, we didn't put any ads into it. We didn't do any other marketing strategies. It's just whatever happened with our last song that just had that big global explosion on the internet. It's all been organic listeners and they're obviously coming back and listening because we haven't dropped at all. It's just gone up. So it's nice. It's organic. People aren't being forced to listen to it on an editorial playlist. That would be cool at some point being put on it, but it's real people 100% and they're going out of their way to listen. Yeah, absolutely. And that being three months ago, that shows right there. It's not one of those things where, hey, it becomes a trend on TikTok and then it goes away and it drops back down. It's been sustainable. I was really worried about that. It's a really tough thing to see too. You see this huge spike and you get all excited and then it dies down. I've seen that happen to way too many friends where it's like, oh man, they really deserve to stay up there, stay on the peak, you know? Even if there's a plateau, don't drop back down the other side. So it's really nice to hear that for you guys. It's still climbing. For sure. That's where the marketing comes into play. Now, this is a viral trend we're talking about here. And I was dealing with some personal stuff even during that time. And I was like, I got to capitalize on this. Now, that would have probably been the case. The listeners probably would have shot back down if we didn't earn these people's respect. Now, the way to earn that respect is obviously participate in this trend. Go on all their videos and thank them that they are doing this and using our sound. Hook them. I don't think anything that I did during that trend was the wrong thing. It's been questioned before. I'm just being my genuine self and I'm super appreciative of all the people that were using the sound. I'm going to go through thousands of these videos and tell them thank you. And it was cool. Get a lot of replies back, honestly. And they were super thankful that we even took the time to go on there and say thank you. And it's that simple. Sit there for like two hours and scroll through the videos, like them, repost them, and say thank you. You earn their respect then. And then you just earn it more when you go live and you talk to them. I got time for it. Um, that's why I do it. Because like, if I have the time especially, and I have the advantage to be able to do that, it's not just about capitalizing on keeping them hooked. It's also just displaying what we're about. We're about family. And the second that you're a part of that, you're part of the family. That's how everybody in the band views it. And that's how I view it. I started saying that slogan and like, even the guys were like, dude, we should make that a thing. One big family. Like that's what it should be. And I was like, all right, well, I'll keep putting it in our posts. I'll put it in the <laughs> important posts, especially, but we're going to have business cards with our promo on it, the late nine logo and all our information, QR code and at the bottom and fine print. It's going to be there. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we're pushing that for the, the entirety of our career. 100%. And I have to say, the artists that I see who have made it 
from, let's say, the rock scene, I'm not talking like pop stars or anything like that, they have built up a community among their fans. So like going old school, you look at AFI, they had a forum back in like 2001, 2002, and their fans flocked together because of this band. I Fight Dragons, Enter Shikari, same thing. All of these bands brought their communities together as they were growing. And that community has led to the longevity of the band in those cases. So do you have a platform where your fans can connect to each other, like a Facebook group or something like that? I have a street team on Instagram, like the band profiles on it. So the band can answer to people when they're in there, but it's got pop in there like a couple times a week, but like they're all such good friends in there. So they're having the time of their life in that street team chat even without late nine being a part of the 24 7 do i go in there there's like 99 plus notifications every time i go to look at it so it's like they're all getting along with each other and having fun i do have a discord as well that people uh, can jump in and be part of that as well but it's great dude yeah we got the street team on facebook too so anyone that wants to be part of that we get a public group on pretty much any app that you can get on people can talk in post in and just be themselves that's huge because you know, ultimately, this has always been my theory about bands who do what you're doing is you foster the connections between new friends and they're going to have positive memories associated with your music, which means that they're going to come back to your music when they want to feel positive things. It's like Pavlov's Bell. Positive feelings around your band, when they need positive feelings, they will come back to your band for that comfort. That is huge. And, you know, we're not saying you should go out and manipulate people (laughs) like Pavlov and the cats, but if you can genuinely give them positive changes in their lives, which I'd say new friends are always positive changes, give them that through your community. That's huge. If every band could do what you're doing right now, Kai, that would make such a difference, I think. I think so too. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the one that's doing that because there's a lot of other people doing it as well. There's so many bands that I recognize that do that. And those are the bands that have the most of my support. My favorite band is Motionless and White. They have done so many things to like earn that title in my life. Just the way they are with their fans, the way they connect with them and make them feel like they're part of a family. Even next to the music, Motionless has great music. But next to that is just the way they are as artists. I really love and respect them for that. I have friends on the internet who've had the honor of stepping on stage with them as well as myself. It's just absolutely amazing. Just the musicianship that I've followed over the years. And that's the message that I got just watching the the way they are. And I was like, that's another inspiration. Another example of what I want to be as a vocalist, especially because I met him in person for the first time, like a little over a week ago. And he was exactly the way that I expected him to be. Super humble, very just sweet dude. Made me feel right at home course you got to make someone feel right at home especially if you're giving them like such an intense scary opportunity to get up on a stage with so many people he made it easy for me because i've never done that before i've been in front of decent sized crowds but nothing like that it was thrilling (laughs) to say the least so he's just doing a lot for his fans and he's doing a lot for upcoming bands as well which is sick he's giving them that time to shine the decade plus i've been listening to them that's been on a bucket list for me the fact that that happened, when you manifest shit and it comes true, it makes you actually be like, manifesting actually is a real thing. Let's go. <laughs> this sounds like something that you planned out for that show because Motionless and White just toured through New England a week ago. So this is something that you planned out and they said, hey, we want to have you come up do this song. Yeah, with Chris. They did an open verse challenge a long time ago. I partaked in that. A couple of the people that he actually took up in the past like year as well partook in it. So I did that and like, I've done covers in the past too, you know, got their attention where they appreciated it, left a like and a comment, which I thought was super cool. And then I did a Slaughterhouse cover and that's where Chris finally commented and said, Hey, you're next up for Slaughterhouse guest vocals. And I was like, Whoa, that is sick. You know, my idol doing something like that. I'm like, damn, this is crazy. And from idol to like that friendship was pretty cool. The fact that he was so humble and he, He's just a great guy, you know? He took me in to do that, which was just amazing. It's just great to see that someone that you hold so high gave you such a cool opportunity. But yeah, it was definitely through a TikTok cover. He had left that comment on one of those posts and I was obviously super stoked. And then 
you know, we stayed in contact for a couple of months. The New Hampshire date rolled up and it was, yeah, dream come true. Unbelievable moment for sure. It was super cool. Had a lot of family there as well. It was unreal. That's amazing. I'm so stoked for you, man. Like, first of all, I'm going to do my best to find videos of this to put in the show notes so people can check this out if they're listening. And, you know, I'm not a vocalist, but if one of my favorite bands told me in advance, we want you to sing this song. As much as I would say I'm not doing it because I can't sing, if I were a singer like you, I would be so stoked. Yeah, it was crazy. That had to be like a a life-defining moment right there. Yeah, we have like a full performance video that I had done from a good friend of mine. It's like super quality and stuff. It's on all my socials, so you can find it there if you want. (laughs) Oh, perfect. That'll be the easiest one to find. That is just so sick. So kind of on a related note, you know, you fostered that connection with Chris through TikTok because that's where you did that cover. When it comes to social media, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook groups, whatever it is, that's a lot to manage. Are there any tools that you use to help you with all this or do you just do it directly on those platforms? Pretty much directly through the platforms. We have a record label. We have Ghost Killer Entertainment. They do whatever an independent label can do to help you. But when it comes to being on the front lines and taking all that shit head on, it's just mainly me and the boys. So, you know, the guys write music on the regular. The guys push promo on their personals and stuff. But when it comes to band pages and stuff, I really try to put myself in front of the camera. Everyone pulls their weight though. You know, we all do the thing and crush it. Me, Jay, Dennis, Chris, and Shay, they all crush it. And they're all great musicians and they all have something really special about them. And we all work very well together. Yeah. I think that's such an important thing to have a band that has a good dynamic and they work well together. That's really the keys to any business. And a band is a business. Like that's how you're running it. That's why you're doing this. Like ultimately it's a passion, but mm-hmm. it's also a business. So Kai, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure of a chat with you. Before I let you go, I want to ask two things. One, what is next for Late Nine? And two, where can people find Late Nine on the internet? What is next for us? We plan to tour the whole US in 2024, no matter what. No ifs, ands, and some buts. We're doing it. Sick. We're going to have a new EP. We have that in the works. We have a part two for Breathe For Me already planned out as well. That song will be called No Longer Breathing. It's going to be super heavy. And then we have a really poppy song as well. So we're catering to both audiences and we're stoked. But you can also find us at Late Nine Boston, everywhere on the internet. We appreciate you guys. Find us on all streaming platforms at Late Nine. Much love. One big family. Keep on showing your support to the Band Hive podcast. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Kai, thank you so much, man. It's been a pleasure. And since we're both in New England, I'm looking forward to checking you guys out live as soon as possible. Let me know when you're coming up to Vermont and I will do my best to be there. Will do. Good hangs in the future. Peace, brother. Have a great day and thanks so much. You too, man. Thanks.